gather as saints. Lord, we just pray for humble, submitted hearts as we receive your word, Father. And we pray that this will transform us as we asked earlier. Father, we pray that Chris will have the courage to preach this word boldly. And as you always have, we pray that he will continue to preach this boldly, but have the love to do so humbly. Um, Father, we're so grateful for the fact that we are able to receive these teachings, Lord. Uh, let this not just be another Sunday, Father. We'll keep praying the same thing. Let us be a changed people, Father. You must become greater, and we must become less. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah, so the preteens are heading out? All the kiddies, flee from us. Children. Yeah, worship Arthur. Kitties can head up. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Boerter. I'm one of the elders of Crowded House Church. Uh, it's amazing to be here this morning. Uh, my wife, Julie, sitting in the front there. And my two amazing kids, Adam and Lauren, sitting over there. So uh, it's wonderful to be here today, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so for those of you who don't know, we're currently in a series called uh, My Kingdom. So, sorry. <laughs> Great start. My Kingdom, His Life, right? My Life, His Kingdom. My Life, His Kingdom, right? So for those of you who don't know, we live in a kingdom. We don't live in a democracy. We live in a kingdom where we have a king. God is our king, Right? And God is the sovereign king over all things. If you read from Genesis chapter 1, where God creates everything, to Revelation, where God judges everything, from beginning to the end, we live in a kingdom, right? Through Him, all things were created. By Him, all things were created. He is the boss of everything. He has rule over everything. He has influence over everything in our lives, right? At the same time, we have our own lives, right? You have your own life. You live a life where you go to work, where you, uh, where you have fun with your friends, where you come to church, where you live your various aspects of your life, right? So it's my life and his kingdom, okay? And very often what I, what I find is that people separate the two, right? So there is my Christian life, the, the his kingdom part of it, church, bam, com group, the things that, we, the, the things that are my Christian part of my life, right? And then there is my, the my life part of it. My going to work, my hanging out with my friends, me watching the Springboks play, right? Those are all like my life parts. And, uh, and, and we sometimes separate the two. We almost divorce the two from each other, right? And that's what this whole sermon series is about, is that that's not biblical, right? That's not the way. Every part of our life is called to be part. It's one thing, right? It's your life under his kingdom, right? So our, I, I started the series. I taught on uh, work and the beauty of work, and why God calls us to work, and how your work should glorify God. Then Kev spoke about that your whole life matters. Uh, last week, Kev taught on your heart matters. For those of you who haven't listened to those sermons, I would really encourage you, go on to YouTube, Crowded House Church on YouTube, and you can, uh, you can find the sermons on there. Um, and today I'm going to preach on something that I don't think a lot of you will have heard sermons on before. right? So today is going to be a, a bit of a stretch for you. And for some people, we, as you hear the sermon, it might actually, there's something in your heart that might get a little bit of a stab in your heart. And by the way, if that does happen, if you think this guy's preaching heresy, maybe you need, like, let's pray that the Holy Spirit actually, like, does something in all of our hearts. Um, in preparing for the sermon, uh, I always say to people that when you preach a sermon, it doesn't mean you've got it right, it just means you're the first one to hear it. Uh, and today is once again one of those cases. I'm the first one to hear it, and I really hope that the Lord does something in all of our hearts today. Um, so, Kevin Aldridge, who is the lead elder at Crowded House Church, most of you guys know him, he, he, off, he said something to me this week, and it was actually profound. He said, um, where there is tension, there is health. Where there is tension, there is health, right? So what does tension mean, right? Tension is when you hold two things. Right? So the way I always imagine it in my brain is like if you go to the gym and you've got that machine with the cable, Rich, help me out here, the cable, and you pull the weight and like, <laughs> right, right, and so, so you've got this heavy weight here and you pull this here, right, but now, now what happens is you end up yanking this way the whole time, right, and then there's another weight, now you take the other weight and the other weight wants to pull you in that direction, so you've got these two weights, and you have to hold these two weights in tension with each other the whole time, right, otherwise you'll end up doing that and you'll end up doing that, right. So there is tension. Who of you know that there's tension in the Bible? There is tension in the Bible. So uh, Matthew 16 says, Jesus speaking to his followers, he says, 
deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Yo, that's a tough scripture to listen to, right? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, right? Then Jesus says, uh, in, in Jeremiah, it says, the heart is deceitfully wicked and desperately sick. Kev spoke about that last week. The heart is deceitfully wicked and desperately sick. Then in Luke 14, Jesus says to his disciple, if anyone doesn't hate his brother, his mother, his sister, he cannot be my disciple. That's the tension on the one side. That's true, right? Everybody agree that that's true? That you need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, that your heart is deceitfully wicked, and that you have to hate your brother and mother and sister in comparison to your love that you have for Jesus. That is a tension that we have to hold in truth, right? But then there is another tension on this side, that Jesus says in John 10, 10, he says, I have come and I've come to give you life and life in abundance. God says, I've come to give you a life for life more abundantly. Psalm 139 says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. So yes, your heart is deceitfully wicked, but you're also fearfully and wonderfully made. Is that true? Yeah. Right? And then it says, Jesus does say in Luke 14, He says, you need to hate your mother, brother, and sister in comparison to your love for me. But then He also says, but this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. Right? So who have you, you understand the point here. Like, very often in the Bible, there's these two tensions. And if you don't hold these two things in tension, you will end up getting dragged off in one direction or the other. Now, very, very seldom is that tension absolutely perfect in the center, right? Sometimes God will draw you more towards the one side, and sometimes God will draw you more towards the other side. But you always have to hold these two, and I'm going to use the word, apparent contradictions. You have to hold them in tension, because they both are true. And where there's tension, there is health. So as a church, we have to hold these two intentions when we preach as well. So when we try and hear from the Lord, what are we preaching on? We think about which side of this tension are we leaning towards? Are we leaning too much towards the one side? And I must be honest, as a church, as an eldership, we have a bent to sometimes the deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. The heart is deceitfully wicked and hate your mother, brother. We have a strong tension and sometimes we lean a little bit towards the side. But whoever you know that if we lean too much towards the side, that's wrong. Because there is an other side here as well that we need to hold into tension as well. So today, I'm going to preach about something that I've not preached on before, and uh, I've not heard many sermons on, but the, I'm going to preach on enjoyment, right? For the teens in the room, uh, today I'm going to use the F word in my sermon. Um, I'm going to drop the F bomb, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about God's pet. Did you know that God has a pet? Uh, we're going to learn how many hearts an octopus has. Who of you know? Just by, Don't shout out. How many, how many hearts does an octopus have? No, I don't answer. By the way, <laughs> by the way, you are wrong. Um, you're going to learn about the fingerprints of a giraffe. We're going to talk about our holidays. We're going to talk about movies, more specifically one of my favorite movies. And we're going to talk about cheering for the spring box, right? Everybody okay with that, right? Uh, we're gonna, and we're going to talk about how we can do all of these things to the glory of God. We can do all of these things to the glory of God. So if you're looking for a title, the title of today's message is Your Enjoyment Matters. Your Enjoyment Matters. So Kev once told me a story, and uh, it was, he said, um, I think he heard somebody else say it, but still, I, th I think it's incredibly relevant. And think about your life, right? Imagine you get to heaven one day, and Jesus says to you, So, Chris, my boy, how is that? Did you enjoy that? What would your answer be? Right? I don't know. Uh, I don't know what my answer would be. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that my answer would be, yes, Lord, I loved it. That was amazing. Thank you for that life. I don't know. There was a lot of laying down your life, taking up my cross and following me. Uh, not an awful lot of come to live life and life more abundantly. Right? That's how a lot of us might feel. That life is tough, right? That li life is hard. And that a life which God has given to us to enjoy, God has given you a life to enjoy, did you enjoy it? Uh, here's a good question. You know, often when you meet somebody new, you ask them, so what do you do for fun? What do you do for enjoyment? Right? So invariably, people will answer, you know, uh, I play tennis, I read, I do whatever that may be for you, right? How often would you say, what do you do for fun? What do you do for enjoyment? And I live my life to the glory of God. Who of you would say that? Is, does, does that not, like, if, if you heard somebody say that to you, that, what do you do for fun? No, I worship Jesus. Right? D does that sound right? Amen. 
Is there anybody? Yeah, um, there might be Nick Sparger, except for him. Uh, is, is there anybody else that like, feels that, that that almost jars in your brain, that that doesn't quite sound right, that I worship Jesus for fun? It doesn't quite sound right. And I think here's where Christians, sometimes we have this tension that we have to hold, right? And I think we can yank this tension towards the left here, where we become handmaid's tale, right? The, it becomes, so what do you do as a Christian? I, I, I wear a cover over my head. I submit. I lay down my life. I'm repenting. I'm always, and yes, we are all of those things, right? But yes, are you also called to enjoy life? Are you called to enjoy life? Yes, you are 100% called to enjoy life. So that, today we're going to unpack why God is concerned with how much you enjoy your life. And we're going to start by using the F word. And the F word is God is a God of fun and enjoyment. God is a God of fun and enjoyment. Fun is something that God created. God created fun. And the world has stolen it. The world has stolen it. You know, Satan has never created anything. Satan doesn't create anything. Satan is not a creator. He's a distorter. He takes something that God has created and he distorts it. Satan has distorted fun. Fun and enjoyment was something that God created and Satan has distorted. So we're going to try and talk today about how we can get that back. So I'm going to give you five reasons just to prove, because I'm sure a lot of you don't believe me when I say that God is a God of fun and enjoyment. I'm going to give you five reasons why I believe God is a God of fun and enjoyment, right? We're going to start, reason number one, joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, love, joy, joy. So when you've got the Holy Spirit inside you, you have joy, right? And what is enjoyment other than finding joy in something? Enjoyment is joy in action. It's when you enjoy something is when joy is actually in action. How much of joy in action do you do? Secondly, that do you know that we as humans were created in the image of God? You were created in the image of God. Who of you actually enjoy enjoying things? Who of you like to have fun? Just by a quick show of hands, right? right? Do you know that you were created in the image of God? So uh, if you are created in the image of God and you enjoy having fun, do you not think that maybe enjoying things and having fun is from God? Absolutely. We were created in His image. We were, we were called to enjoy us, right? God created a world of beauty and enjoyment. He did not create a functional world. Richard, thank you for stealing half my sermon, by the way, with your intro, which is so good, right? <laughs> Just talks about the Holy Spirit. We're all alive. So I have this picture in my mind, right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Who of you know what happens in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, very often overlooked part of the creation, right? God brings all the animals to Adam to name them. Did you know that God brought all the animals to Adam to name them, right? And I have this picture in my mind, you know? God could have created the world incredibly functional, right? Think about God could have created things with blocks and white and black and things that fit together and neat and tidy and everything. God did not create it like that. Do you know why God created a, a weird and wacky world? He created it for His glory and for our good and for us to enjoy. Amen. Absolutely, right? So I, I have this picture in my mind, and I might be, this might be heresy, but I, I have this picture of, do you think Adam sat like this, right? I'm going to sit on the cajon here. And God brought all the animals by, and Adam went like, lion, leopard, cheetah? Or do you think God brought the animals in front of Adam, and Adam went like, what is this thing with the four long legs and this massive neck? What did you, why did you create this thing, God? This thing is amazing. What am I going to call it? We're going to call it a giraffe. Oh, wow, that is amazing. Look at, this, look at the size of the length of this neck of this thing, right? It is enormous. And do you know, Adam, here's point one, he creates the patches on a giraffe is like fingerprints, right? No two giraffes have the exact same patches. You can tell giraffes apart by their patches, right? Then imagine God bringing an octopus to Adam, right? And he says, you've got to name this thing. And he has this thing with eight legs and, it's, and, like, uh, right? and, and God says, Adam, I need you to name this thing, right? He says, yes, it's, we'll call it a, it's got eight legs, so we're going to call it an octopus, right? And then he says, an octopus, by the way, just so you know, this thing has got three hearts in it. Right, there's your answer, right? You know what God called, he created an octopus with three hearts. He created this beautiful thing for our enjoyment. An anteater, an anteater. Imagine the anteater walking in front of Adam, and Adam goes, which side is the front? There's, there's this tail and this like, tongue. You know, an anteater has a, a, a tongue that's two feet long, and it can flick in and out of its mouth 150 times per minute, right? So we're going to do that now quickly. Everybody ready? What? God created these beautiful things. He did not create them for pure function. Yes, an anteater can use his tongue, but God created an anteater looking very funny for his glory and for our good and for our enjoyment. 
He created a giraffe to be flipping seven meters long and run 50 k's an hour for his glory and for our enjoyment, right? Turn with me in your Bible, if you would, to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Psalm 104 was written by, uh, by David, by, uh, and it kind of recaps a lot of God's creation, right? So we're going to start from verse 1. It's quite a long chapter. We're going to go through it, and we're going to jump to and throw through it. But it's actually, when you read it with the right heart, it is actually astonishing. Psalm 104, and we're going to start from verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are covered, sorry, you are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the water. He makes the clouds his chariot, and he rides on the wings of the wind. He rides on the wings of the wind. You know why God rides on the wings of the wind? Do you think God decided, I need to ride on the wings of the wind to get from point A to point B. I need to get there because I need to ride on the wings. So I'm going to ride on the wings of the wind. No, no, he doesn't ride on the wings of the wind to get from point A to point B. God can get there by himself. He is everywhere. He rides on the wings of the wind because he can, because it's beautiful, because he does it for his enjoyment. God celebrates it. The clouds are his chariot. You know why God makes the clouds his chariot? Because he needs a chariot? Because he can. He makes his messengers winds. His ministers are flaming fire. We're going to jump to verse 10. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. A wild don- the wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heaven dwell, and they sing among the branches. Ever wonder why God created birds to sing? Functionally, you know, God could have chosen any means if God was a functional, purely functional God, He could have created any means for birds to communicate with each other. You know what He did? He created for them to sing, to communicate with each other. From the lofty abode, your waters in the mountains, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow, the livestock, uh, sorry, grass to grow for the livestock, and the plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. So everybody needs to remember Psalm 104, verse 15. There is so much in there, right? <laughs> right. First of all, God created wine to gladden the heart of men. Now, how often, by the way, and this is a trap I step in, right? How often don't we think, you know, wine is sin, alcohol is evil. The abuse of wine, the abuse of alcohol is evil. But wine in and of itself is not sin. It says in Psalm, the next time somebody says to you, you shouldn't drink wine, you quote Psalm 104, verse 15. God created wine to gladden the heart of men. God created something to make your heart glad. God created that to make your heart glad. He made oil to make your face shine. So men, moisturizer, right? I was saying to my wife this morning, there's a case for moisturizer and bread to strengthen man's heart. Amen, Amen right? Love bread. Love bread, right? Now, Satan has stolen all of these things and turned it into gluttony, he's turned it into drunkenness. But you know what? God created that for your enjoyment. Do you enjoy it? Do you think? And can I be honest with you? I had a big argument with Kevin probably 18 months ago about, he, he, he made the statement, he said, you can enjoy a good steak and a glass of wine to the glory of God. And I wasn't there. I thought he was almost preaching heresy at that point in time. But the Lord has done a journey with me. He's walked with me as he always does. And I've changed my heart. I absolutely think you can have a good steak and a glass of wine to the glory of God. You can, absolutely. Let's jump to verse 24. From verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both great and small. There go the ships, the Leviathan, which, formed, which you formed to play in it. The Leviathan, so for those of you who don't know what a Leviathan is, a Leviathan is like a, 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 what they call it, like a sea snake, a sea monster, whether that be a megalodon or a massive crocodile or something. It was a sea creature that, 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 that the Jews believed lived in the ocean. God created this creature to live in the ocean, right? This massive monstrous thing, right? Now here's the thing that absolutely blew my mind, right? So first of all, it says the, the, the Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. God created the Leviathan to play in the ocean. To play. To play. 
God created the animal to play in the ocean. Now, if you go read some, some of the Hebrew scriptures, right, some of the Hebrew translators actually says to play with. God created this animal in the ocean for God to play with. So if you want to know what the pet of God is, the Leviathan is God's pet that he plays with in the ocean. Isn't that amazing? God creates these beautiful things, right? And we get so stuck on, on the tension of, of this side that we overlook things in the Bible that are so beautiful. That God's created these things for us to play and enjoy. Verse 27. These all look for you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. Do you believe that, that when God opens His hand to you, He opens it and it's filled with good things? When you hide your face, you, they are dismayed. And when you, ta- when you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Verse 31. May the, law, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in His works. The Lord rejoices in His work. You know why God rides on the wings of the winds? You know why the clouds are His chariot? Because He rejoices in His works. So should we. We should rejoice in His works. Who looks on the earth and trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May the meditations be pleasing to Him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Psalm 104, for me, when I read it, changed my mind entirely about how our approach to life should be. Our life, everything in our life should be to the glory of God. You can enjoy things to the glory of God. Point number four. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 4. Right? So you're going to go from Psalm, you're going to skip over the major prophets, minor prophets. Zechariah chapter 4, ch- sorry, chapter 8, verse 4. Right? So by the way, Zechariah chapter 8 is a picture of heaven. It's a picture of, uh, that, the, that, the, that Zechariah has about the future Zion, which is a picture of heaven, right? And from verse 4, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with a staff in their hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Boys and girls playing in the streets. The Bible is full of this, actually. The more you start reading it, the more you see play is something, play and fun and enjoyment is something that we see throughout the Bible. Uh, I remember my kids always had this, they had this, like, fear almost, right? When we talk about heaven, you say, so what are we going to do in heaven? We're going to glorify God. So my kids, I remember that they had this thing like, this, like heaven is going to be an eternity long worship service, right? So we're going to be there with your book and you're going to be singing, you're going to be singing for eternity, right? So like, yeah, I'm going to go to heaven. Yeah, sure. Um, but that's what it says. So what, what do the kids do in heaven? You know what the kids do to glorify God? They play. They play. That's what they're going to do in heaven. It's beautiful. And then Psalm 16, verse 11. You don't have to go there. Uh, they'll put it on the screen. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The last thing, why, just to build a case for why God is a God of fun and enjoyment, is who have you, when you go read the Old Testament, when you read the, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you see the festivals that God introduces, right? You know what the festivals were all about? So there's the Rosh Hashanah, and there's Yom Kippur, and there's all of the various other festivals, festival of shelters, you know? You know what, what was the one thing that every festival has in common? Food, drinking, and jawling, Right? With almost, with, almost without exception, every festival was about celebrating, right? Uh, most included singing, dancing, eating, and community. There's a, there's a festival called the, I'm going to probably mispronounce it awfully, the Shimchat Torah. Simchat Torah, right? Uh, the, that is the festival that the Jews have when they finished reading the Torah. When they read the last chapter of Deuteronomy, they've now read the entire book of the Bible, right? And you know what they do? They take the, they take the, the Torah, the book of the Bible, and they dance, and they drink, and they jewel, and they eat, and they have a party, and they dance around the Word of God. They celebrate that they had the Word of God to read throughout the entire year. And you know what they do the very next day? They start at Genesis chapter 1 again. And they go through the Torah again. Do we, are we a people who celebrate the Word of God? Who dance around the Word of God? When you hear this, is this something that, 
feels a little bit strange to you? Is it feel a little bit off to you? Like, should we be dancing? Should we be holding up the Bible and dancing? Right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. We should be holding up the Bible and dancing. Right? So we all agree, right? Anybody disagree? Hopefully not. That God is a God of fun and enjoyment. Right? Secondly, gratitude and enjoyment are incredibly closely linked. Gratitude and enjoyment are very closely linked. Now, godly enjoyment is like a pair of glasses that you put on through which you view the world. And these lenses make you grateful. Enjoying your life will change how you view your life, and how you view your life will impact how you enjoy your life. So I'm going to tell you guys a story of a guy's life, right? A man's life. Uh, his name is, we'll call it Bris Quitter, right? So it sounds something like, <laughs> right? Uh, you can make your own distinction about who's guy, right? And I'll tell you how his life unfolds, right? Um, so this guy wakes up in the morning, right? And uh, when he wakes up in the morning, he hears the hardy dows and the geese, right? Ha, ha, it's like four in the morning and uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to get a shotgun and kill that flipping bird. And then you hear the, the, the Egyptian geese, the, and you're on, your, on your roof and it's going to drive you insane. It's four in the morning and why did these birds wake me up? I'm going to get the shotgun and go outside and go kill some birds, right? You wake up, you get out of bed, get life ready, uh, you go to work and you go work for your cruddy boss and you think, oh, this boss, this boss, this boss and I and you do in your job and you're working and you're grafting and end of the day, it's like, oh, thank goodness, end of the day, I can go home. You come home and because you're a little bit overweight, you have to go for a run, right? So you have to go for a run because you are a little bit overweight. So uh, off you go and you go for a little run and you trot and it's sore, my legs are sore and I'm tired and then when you're done with that, then you have to go to this church thing, right? So off I have to go have to go to this church thing, uh, go to the church thing, come back late. Um, <laughs> those who know, know. Uh, <laughs> then you get to bed, you get to bed, and when you get to bed, you decide, you've got guilty conscience, I have to read my Bible. Oh, I to, oh, I'm so tired, all I want to do is sleep, but I'm, I get to read my Bible, I open my Bible, I read my Bible, like, uh, uh, I put my Bible down, right? Then I hit, uh, put my head on my pillow, not me. Chris Bush quarter guy, right? Um, <laughs> and eight hours later, you wake up and you do it all over again. Oh my gosh, Hardy does an Egyptian geese, right? So uh, now, right now, the guy, this guy over here, he's going to live the exact same day again. The exact same day again. But we're going to just put a slightly different lens on, right? He gets woken up by the birds. The Hardy does with their little white thing on their cheek. They're actually such beautiful birds, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Psalm 118 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. And how does it go then? I will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I go to work and I learn. I learn. You know, every time I go to work, I learn. I learn something new. And I get to earn money, which I can use for the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus, for my job. I come home, and here's the word I want you to understand. I have to versus I get to. My running coach taught me this, and it was one of the most important lessons. I think it's so important in everything in our life. I have to go for a run? No, no, no. I get to go for a run. Right? I get to go for a run. I love running. Uh, my wife and I go run. We often go run at like half past five, six o'clock in the evening once, I, once I'm back from work. And the sun's setting, the moon's coming up, and you can just see the beauty of nature. We run through Gallimana there by Luke and them. And there's a black-headed oriole. I love birds. I think they're the most beautiful creatures on earth. There's a black-headed oriole that lives in, 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 uh, in Woodmead Springs in Gallimana there. And I can hear this bird just, it's beautiful call while you're running. And you can feel your, the, lung, the air going through your lungs. And you can just praise God. I was glad. Like, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God made me fearfully and wonderfully. Then I get together with God's saints at church. You know, David says in Psalm 102, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. I was glad. How many of you woke up this morning and thought, yes, it's church time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Hands up if that was you this morning. <laughs> Liars, <laughs> all of you. <laughs> right? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord, right? Yes, yes, I get to gather with God's saints. Praise Jesus, right? I come home, I, I don't have to read my Bible. I get to read my Bible, right? 
My favorite, a lot of you will have heard this before. My fa- one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Psalm 119, verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things in your law. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things in your law. Open the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and you see wondrous things in there. You see wondrous things in there. Then when I put my head in my pillow at night, I said to Jesus, Thank you for another wonderful day, Lord God. Fill my night with dreams of you, dreams of your glory. Let me dream about you tonight, Lord God. And you go to bed with her. The exact same life. If it was a TV show without the volume up, it was the exact same life. Nothing different that they did. It was the lenses that they had on. The lenses of gratitude, the lenses of enjoyment that they gave them. Gratitude and enjoyment are very closely linked. The more grateful you are for things, the more you enjoy them. The more you enjoy things, the more you are grateful for them. God gave you one life to enjoy, therefore be very grateful for it. But guilt can be the enemy of enjoyment. Guilt is the enemy of enjoyment. Does anybody know what the name Satan means? Satan is accuser. Well done, my wife. Uh, Right. I'm very proud of that, actually. I didn't tell her. She just knew that. It means accuser. Satan's name is accuser. I said at the beginning, Satan's never created anything. He's distorted. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who accuses you. So, uh, let's say, for example, uh, and I'm sure this has never happened to you, but it's happened to me, right? You're watching the Springbox play. You're watching the Booker play, right? And you know what's the first thing that comes to mind? You know what? I haven't read my Bible in a while. Maybe I must rather go read my Bible. Maybe, uh, like, or I should rather be out the streets evangelizing, right? Do you think you can watch the Springbox play and glorify God? 100% you can. 100% you can, right? Satan is the accuser of men. He accuses you. He is the one who accuses you, right? How do you watch this, the booker to the glory of God? You have friends over. You thank God for a winning team. We have a flippant winning team. We have an amazing team this year, right? <laughs> right? We pray that God continues to unite us as a nation through our Springbok team, right? We pray for them. We pray for Sia Kulisi. We pray for Peter Steph Toy. We pray for Cheslin Colby. We pray for all of them, right? We thank Jesus for Sasha Feinberg and Komazulu who is coming to the team. <laughs> You're such a blessing to us all, right? You can watch the Springbox play to the glory of God. You can watch him, watch the Springbox play and not glorify God in it. It all depends on how you approach it. God blesses you with money. How often does this happen? You get uh, blessed with money. Everybody, <laughs> say, anybody get blessed with money lately? Check the giving, right? Uh, uh, when you get blessed with money, right? What's the first thing for, for me? And again, I'm talking about me maybe, right? What very often happens is you get, if, if, you get, if you come upon money, you get money. The first thing like often happens is like you get convicted, like maybe I should give this money away. I should give it to the poor. I should give it away. And sometimes, by the way, yes, you should. The Holy Spirit will talk to you, and the Holy Spirit will tell you, take all you have, sell it, and give it to the poor. Jesus, there's 100% biblical principle for it. So I'm not saying if you, the next time you get money and the Holy Spirit impresses on your heart to give it away, that you should go, no, Chris said we shouldn't. So uh, <laughs> tough luck, right? But sometimes God will give you money for your enjoyment. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Psalms, and the book of Ecclesiastes, God says, enjoy the fruit of your labor. Enjoy the fruit of your labor. So if you get money and you do decide that you... And by the way, this is the thing, right? Go pray about it. Go hear from the Lord. God, what would you have me do with this money? Because it is, in the end, it is your money. What would you have me do with it? Right? And if God says, you need to give it all away, give it all away. But give it away joyfully. Enjoy giving it away. And if God says, no, no, Chris, I gave it to you to go buy yourself a new G-Wagon, then yes, I am going to go buy myself a new G-Wagon. Right? You can. Absolutely. But when you get that G-Wagon, by the way, I do not drive a G-Wagon in case you're wondering. Right? Uh, when you get that G-Wagon, use it to the glory of God. Do you know you can get a new car to the glory of God? Right? You wake up, every time you get in your new car, you say, thank you, Jesus, for this car. Thank you for this blessing. Thank you for blessing me. I'm going to listen to worship music every time I get into my new car, right? And you know what? When I'm going to use my car. So the UJ guys, the UJ guys still need lifts. Guys, we need more people putting up their hands for the UJ guys to help out with lifts. Please put up your hands. Your car was given to you as a gift for enjoyment, but you're going to use it for the glory of God by driving the UJ guys back to, back to UJ, right? So you can use your cars to drive the UJ guys back, right? We, you can glorify God. You can help others, right? Can you use that G-Wagon to the glory of God? Absolutely. Should you use it? Absolutely. If not, 
then it is not, you are not enjoying it in the right way. But remember that tension always. Sometimes God will ask you to take that money and give it away. And then when you get to go on holiday, ever feel guilty about going on holiday? You shouldn't, right? Again, you get to go on holiday sometimes to the glory of God. You can go on holiday to the glory of God. You absolutely can. God rested. If you're going with a guilty conscience on holiday, you're not going to rest. God rested. We see in the book of Mark, Jesus goes into a city and He heals everybody in the city, even His disciples. Everything gets healed, cleaned out, cleared. Amazing, like all to the glory of God. You know what's the first thing Jesus does? He takes His disciples. Let's go away, guys. Let's go away. Let's go, into, let's go into the bush. Takes them into the mountains and takes them away. Gets them to go and rest. God does that with us. We run hard. Sometimes God's going to call you to go and rest. Right? Go to the Drakensberg. Go walk in the Drakensberg. You know when you walk in the Drakensberg and you see those massive mountains around you and those cliff faces? You know why God created them? He could have created a, a block with stairs in it for you to walk on, right? And you climb up the stairs, right? He didn't. He created these beautiful mountain faces. You know why He created it? For His glory and for your enjoyment. You can walk up that mountain, you look at those beautiful green sides, and you can praise God in all of it. You know, I, I, I was thinking the other day, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking... Listen, I, I don't have geography. I don't have geography. But, you know, I don't think there is really a functional purpose. I, I stand to be corrected. I don't think there's really a functional purpose to waves in the ocean, right? I don't think there is. Please don't correct me. I, uh, <laughs> d d just work with me, right? There is no functional purpose to waves, right? Yes, exactly right. That is the purpose of waves. You know why God created waves? For us to surf in. For us to play. I really think this is scientifically true because I did Google it, right? You know why, you know why dolphins swim in waves? You know what they do? Because it's fun. They don't, there's no, it's not like they get like minerals or vitamins in their ear. And, you know, they swim in waves for God's glory and because it is fun. Don't be deceived. You can glorify God through your enjoyment. And your enjoyment, by the way, will one day impact your gospel message. Has yeah. anyone, anyone ever brought you a good news with, uh, uh, um, with a sour face? Right? And somebody walks up to you and says, um, So, uh, Julie, um, we've uh, uh, won the lottery and we've got five million rand. Um, <laughs> right? Trust me, if I win the lottery... That is not how my reaction is going to be, right? Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 from verse 17 to 20. Can I just say, for those of you who have a, a paper Bible with you, I think as a, as a, as a, as a preacher... The most beautiful sound that any preacher can hear is the sound of people paging their Bibles. It is, it's beautiful. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20. So what happens in Luke chapter 10 is the, 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 Jesus sends out 72 of his disciples. He sends them to go baptize, to heal, to, 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 uh, to perform miracles in various cities, drive out demons. The 72 return, right? So the, then the 72 return, they give their report. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20. The 72 return with joy. How did they return? Joy. You know what that looks like. They returned smiling. They returned happy after doing God's work, right? What did they say? Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Now verse 20. Verse 20 it just blows my mind every time I read it. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your names are written in heaven. Saints, do you know that today? That your name is written in heaven. If you don't know that for certain, we're going to pray for you afterwards. That your name is written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven. One day you're going to die and you're going to, you're going to meet Jesus. Your name is written in heaven. Some other translation says, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I personally love that translation. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is good news. That is the best news, right? Now, if you don't enjoy that, if you don't rejoice in that, if you don't share that with joy, how can you possibly share that with anybody else, right? In the book of Acts, chapter 2, 
the Holy Spirit comes upon everybody in the upper room, right? And the, they start speaking in tongues. They start speaking in foreign languages. And they run out into the street speaking foreign languages, right? And the people who see the, 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 the early disciples do this, you know what they say about them? They say, these people are drunk. Right? Now, why would you think that somebody is drunk? Do you think that they maybe, when, those, when the early disciples ran out of the upper room, that they were rejoicing? Yeah. They, might have been, they were glorifying God in a different language that they didn't even understand, right? When we come out here, do people sometimes think that we are drunk? Because we are so rejoicing in the Lord. The enjoyment of a faithful life on earth and a joyous anticipation of, interni- of eternity with our Creator is essential to your gospel message. I'm going to say that again. The enjoyment of a faithful life on earth and a jo- and joyous anticipation of eternity with our Creator is essential to the gospel message. What are you calling people to? What are we, what's the life that we're calling people to? If, uh, and some, by the way, again, this is where we have to hold the tension. Sometimes you are going to meet somebody and you, you say, your heart is deceitfully wicked, right? You need to lay down your life, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow, follow Jesus, right? There is that tension, right? And we have to do that. But you know, there's this other side of the tension as well. It says God has got a life for you that is more abundant, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? And so often with our gospel message, if we yank too far to this side, we lose this tension over here. We lose the tension of calling people to a greater life, to a life of enjoyment, a life of fun, right? And I think once, if we get the tension right, I think we'll direct ourselves a lot better. And then lastly, your enjoyment of life has nothing to do with how much money you have. It has nothing to do with how much money you have. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. One verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. The New King James says with godliness and contentment there is great gain. You know what that means? Godliness is being godly, right? And contentment. You know what contentment means? You are content. You are happy with what you have. There is great gain. So often we, uh, we, we look to other people and we say, I will be happy when I. I will enjoy life when I. Right? So here's where I want to talk about movies, right? So one of my favorite movies of all time, right, is a movie called Cool Runnings. Who of you have seen Cool Runnings? Hey, a... Yes, all the older folk in the room are putting up their hands, right? I love it. Did you notice? Teens, anybody seen Cool Runnings? Hey, you got a few people. Hey, that's impressive, right? Right, yes, man, right? The Jamaican bobsled team, right? So it's a, the, the movie Cool Running is about the Jamaican bobsled team. So Jamaica enters a bobsled team, a team into the Winter Olympics. They're going to do bobsled, right? Now, the, the leader of the Jamaican bobsled team is a guy called Darice, right? You have to say it with a Jamaican accent. Darice, Darice, right? Uh, so Darice, is, uh, he is obsessed with the German and the Swiss teams, right? So he looks at the German team, the Swiss team, and they like go, Ein, zwei, drei, and then they run and then they jump on the, on the bobsled and they go, right? But he is obsessed with the way they do things, right? He's obsessed with what they do, and he thinks doing what they do is what's, what's going to win in the gold medal. And then one of my favorite actors, John Candy. John Candy was the coach. John Candy says one of the greatest lines that is Holy Spirit inspired in the movie <laughs> Cool Writings. He says to Darice, he said Darice, he doesn't say it in Jamaican accent. He says, Darice, he says, if you are not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. If you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. So if you think to yourself, I will start enjoying my life when I dot, 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 that's when you have a problem. If your enjoyment of your life is based on when I have more money, right? I always talk about the three Ps, uh, 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 about people, places, and periods, right? I will enjoy my life when I see my mom. I will enjoy my life when I am with my family. I will enjoy my life when I, right? With people, with places, if, when I get to the sea. I struggle through life, I struggle through my work week, but when I get to the weekend, I will, uh, or periods, when I get to the weekend, when I go on holiday, right? Your life cannot, you cannot only enjoy your life when you reach a certain point, right? You have to be joyful because God saved you. You have to be joyful for the blessings that you've received, big and small. And you have to be joyful, joyful for another day. 
I have a, sometimes the, 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 Lord, the Lord convicts me so much in this myself. Um, so on a Monday morning, I drive my, my daughter, Lauren, to school. Uh, she goes to school in Pretoria. We leave early. We leave at about half past five in the morning. Uh, and then we get into my Mercedes-Benz E350, my big white Mercedes-Benz, beautiful car, climate control, Alice. Get in the car, which I'm very grateful for. And we drive. And then we, when, when we, when we, just before we get on the highway, we see people coming out of Alex. Now, middle of winter, 5.30 in the morning, it's freezing cold, people coming out of Alex, and I, you know, so can I tell you what goes through my heart? I'm going to go drop Lauren at school, then I'm going to go to work, and I have stress about work. I worry about this. I have, like, all of these things that I worry and stress about, and I'm, uh, like, deep down in my side, I, I carry stuff, right? And I walk out, and I see people walking out of Alex in the freezing cold, people walking together, holding hands, laughing, having a jaw, and I think to myself, what's wrong with you, Chris Porter? Uh, here I am in my Mercedes-Benz E350, and these people are, are, are walking to work at 5.30 in the morning in the freezing cold, and they've got a smile on their fa face, right? How, how, how many of you might associate with that, right? The moment you say, I will be happy when, is a very, very dangerous place to be. Enjoyment is for every day. So as Wobbs and Sholto starts getting ready, like... Um, how can we enjoy our life more? How can we enjoy our life more? Get to know God and the real God, your Heavenly Father, right? Get to know God, the real God. Go read Psalm 104 again. Please, I encourage you, go home today and go read it again. For God's glory. God wants you to enjoy your life. He does. Get to know God, the real Heavenly Father. See things as a gift from Him. Do you believe that everything that you receive from the Heavenly Father is a gift? Sometimes you get a gift from Him that is a big bonus. And you go buy the G-Wagon. Sometimes, you know what the gift from Him will be? The gift will be you will get retrenched at work. Do you think that can be a gift? Can you enjoy being retrenched from work? Do you think God does it sometimes for His glory and for your good? He can, guaranteed you can. It's that lens again, right? Have you got that lens on that sometimes retrenchment can mean, uh, can mean a gift from God? Do not let Satan accuse you. You know how you don't let Satan accuse you, right? You know what God says about you. You hear what God says about you. When you get that, when you get that big bonus or money or whatever, right? Whatever comes across your life, somebody takes you on holiday, whatever that may be, right? Go lay that before the Lord and say, Lord, what would you have me do with this? And if God says, give it away, give it away with joy. If God says, go on it, go on it with joy. But you go on it then knowing full well that the Holy Spirit is with you, that God has glorified this, that God is with you. He's approved that, right? Don't let Satan accuse you. Practice an attitude of gratitude and enjoyment. Gratitude for me, man, that have to versus get to has changed my life. It's changed my life. I have to, have to go for a run. I have to read my Bible. I have to, have to versus I get to, I get to is completely different. Stop comparing yourself to others. Theodore Roosevelt said that comparison is the thief of joy. And that's 100% true. The moment you compare yourself to others, that will be the thief of joy. We're going to go into a time of worship now. Um, but as we go into this time of worship, what I pray is that if there's some among you today who... Uh, you've not come to a place where you actually enjoy your life. We actually live a life filled with joy that God's going to break something open for you. Right? And here's what, I, here's what I want to push you on. Right? Sometimes that breaking open of enjoyment is something that is unusual. Right? So if you are one of the people today who, th who you stand and you say, I don't live a life of joy. I don't live a life that I, have, that I enjoy, that I have fun. Right? I'm going to ask that, that at some point during worship today, you come forward. Now, is there something special about coming forward? No, there's not. There's, this is not the holier part of the church, and that's the less holy part of the church right? <laughs> at all, right? But, you know, in the, very often in the Bible, we see that God calls people to do strange things, right? In, uh, in 2 Kings, uh, there's a, the, the Syrian ap captain of the army is Naaman, right? Now, Naaman has got uh, leprosy. So Naaman wants to be healed. So everybody says, go to Elisha. Elisha is your guy. He's going to get you healed, right? 
So he goes to Elisha. Right now, the Syrian commander arrives with his chariots and his mana and others at Elisha's house. You know what Elisha does? Elisha doesn't go out. He sends out one of his servants. He sends out his servant. And you just check how God tests this oak's heart. He says, go out to the guy. Tell him to go wash seven times in the, in the, in the, river, uh, in the river. In the river Jordan. Seven times go wash yourself. Elisha doesn't go out. This guy, first of all, he's offended that the servant comes out and not Elisha himself. And then he says, listen, we have far better rivers in Syria. I'll go wash myself in those dirty rivers, the, the, the dirty river Jordan. I'll go wash myself in our clean rivers in Syria. But his, his manna around him are smart enough to say to him, no, 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 this is the man of God. I think you must listen to what he does. And you know what he does is he's obedient. He goes and washes himself seven times in the river Jordan. I can imagine the first time he comes up, he probably goes, oh my word, this is disgusting. Like, uh, like, and he thinks, he, but he's obedient. He keeps doing it seven times, seven times. He comes out of the river Jordan after the seventh time and he's healed of leprosy. He's healed. Now, for if joy and enjoyment is something in your life that you struggle with, today might be the day that God's saying, you need to go wash yourself seven times in the river Jordan. And by the way, I don't know what that looks like. Maybe he says to you, you need to come forward and you need to join Wob's singing in front. Maybe you need to come forward and dance. And I'm being serious. If God calls you, go pray about it. Think about it. If God calls you forward to dance, come forward and dance. If He calls you to wave a flag, wave a flag. Whatever, whatever that may look like, God calls you to, let's get to a place of joy. Let's be a people who enjoy Jesus. Let's be a people who enjoy that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. I really do hope that God breaks something new open in all of us. And for some of you, by the way, it might mean that you have to repent. That you've gone through a life, and this is where I am sometimes, I've gone through a life of 47 years where very often I don't enjoy my life. God gives me a lot to enjoy, but I don't always enjoy it. And for some of you, it means you might have to come forward, get on your face, and repent to Jesus for not enjoying what He's doing. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord Jesus, that we may see your glory, Lord God, in everything we do. That we may praise your name, that we may ride with you on the wings of the winds, Lord God. Father, that we would be a people who change those glasses that we view our lives through, Lord God. That our lives would be a life of enjoyment, Lord God. Where we glorify you in all we do, Lord God. Whether that be watching the spring box, or singing in worship, reading our Bible, or going for a run, whatever that may be, Lord God, that we would glorify your name, Lord Jesus, that we would enjoy it, that we would enjoy life, Lord God, that one day when we do encounter you, when we stand face to face before our Heavenly Father, and He says to us, so how is that? We would say, yes, Jesus, that was amazing. That was amazing, Lord God. That we would sing like the birds, Lord God, that we would sing and make music to you, Lord God. That we would worship you now, Lord, for enjoyment. For enjoyment for ourselves, but for your glory, Lord God. That we would glorify you through our worship. Holy Spirit, move amongst us. 